let me just explain what I want to do this morning. It's up to you how it goes. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any point. Feel free to um, uh, not, not, not interrupt, that's the wrong word. I, I'll discuss dialogue and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll explain what I am uh, going to do. I remember going into one of my church prayer meetings, which was, I'd normally give just a wee talk and then we'd pray. And I looked out and the people were looking, just their eyes were rolling in their heads. They were tired, they'd come from work. And I said, look, you guys are really tired. I'll just say something for five minutes. We'll pray for 25 minutes and let's go home because you, you look dead. So I started speaking about Paul. Uh, I'm a persecutor, a blasphemer, the most violent of men and all this kind of stuff. And this voice shouts out from the back, that's garbage. You have never seen a congregation wake up so quickly. <laughs> they were just like, woo. And I, I, I said, I looked at him and I thought, okay, he's not drunk, but he's probably stoned. So I said, okay, I'm going to run with this. Why do you think it's garbage? He says, because my name's Paul and I'm a persecutor and a violent man. And he says, but you're talking about Paul the Christian. That's rubbish. So we started talking. And this guy, he kept asking me, he kept going at me, he kept... You know, and he went on about, he says, it's not, it's not fair. He said, my sister was good and she died and I'm a scumbag and I'm still alive. How's that right? And, he, you know, it just, the, the dialogue, at one point, he stood up and he said to me, so I'll do it in Scots first. He went, you, how do you use Ken, you're Christians? And then he looked at me and he says, you, you shut up. You've been talking enough. What about you? And he turned around at the corner, and he, how do you use Ken, you're a Christian? And I'm going, yes, yes. <laughs> I'll pay you, come to church on Sunday. <laughs> do that. It was just brilliant. But do you know this? We had an, more than an hour or so, and then one of my elders stood up and he said, Paul, listen to me. He says, We're done. We're finished here now. He said, I'm going to pray for you. And he was crying. My elder was crying. He said, It's been incredible to have you here and to listen to your questions and to be able to talk about Jesus. Well, I tell you, people came, and then he prayed, and then People came into that prayer meeting exhausted. They went out absolutely buzzing. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that's what you want uh, to happen. So if you've come in here Monday morning, you're exhausted. I hope you go out buzzing. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, I want to begin by just reading a couple of verses from Acts 17. Um, sorry, I meant to say where we're going with this. First bit until coffee at about 11 will be um, kind of, for me, general background of what we're trying to do and then we'll maybe have a coffee break for about 20 minutes and then we're going to, I'm going to look at actual specifics and lots of ideas for churches in terms of reaching out and some of them you go no they're crazy and others you say well what about this what about that because I go around the country and I, I, I pick up all different kinds uh, of ideas and things and I always a bit basic thing for me is don't try and copy another church like for example I've been to Redeemer and I love Tim Keller's uh, ministry, and I love that in Redeemer, but there's one New York and there's one Tim Keller, and anyone trying to replicate it is just stupid. Um, and, and the same with lots and lots of different things. You know, you see successful ministries like St. Helens in London or whatever, and, and people say, oh, we'll do that here. No, you won't. It's, this is Portsmouth, not London, and you're not Dick Lucas, and you don't have a whole bunch of hedge fund managers in your church who are going to fund it. There's different ways. Diff God uses different means and different people, but what you can do is you can go, that's a really interesting idea. I never thought of that. Maybe we can use that. So uh, my own church, I remember one doctor writing from the island of Skye who'd left us and she said, I really miss St. Pete's, the only Presbyterian, Anglican, Baptist, charismatic church I've ever been in my life. <laughs> so, so that means we're probably a bit of a mess. Um, so we'll do that. Acts 17, just at verse, um, this is where in Thessalonica, and they've been dragged. Uh, a lot of people, very successful ministries, some of the Jews persuaded, uh, verse 4, join Paul and Silas as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so a mob was incited, and they dragged them out to the crowd. Um, they dragged Jason and the brothers before the city officials shouting, these men who've caused trouble all over the world have now come here. It's a wonderful book by the Marxist historian Christopher Hill uh, called The World Turned Upside Down. And that is, of course, the King James translation of this particular verse. And Hill, uh, I studied the English Civil War at university, and um, as a Scotsman, my hero is Thomas Cromwell, even though he destroyed my city, Dundee, but we'll forgive him that, because I just, Cromwell, I just think, is just, uh, just amazing. And uh, uh, this verse, 
Hill used that for his book to describe how the Puritans and others turned English society upside down, and I, I was just fascinated um, with it. But the thought goes through my head. I wonder when the church was last accused of turning the world upside down, you know? I think in Romania, absolutely. I think in Africa. I think the Chinese are terrified of what could happen there. But I think we've got a very, very tame form of Christianity, even evangelicalism. And we just don't want to be any bother. We don't want to upset people. We don't, we don't want, and I'm going, if your evangelism is going to be effective, the first thing that's going to happen is the devil's going to get furious. And you will find that you upset people. Now, I'm not advocating at all, and you must realize this, go out and upset people for the sake of upsetting people. Being obnoxious. There's being offensive. Or there's the offense of the cross, and, there's, and then there's just your offense. Um, or my offense, and uh, I know many times in my life I've been offensive to people uh, in a crass and ignorant and stupid way, but when you teach about Jesus, that's incredibly offensive to so many people, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm gutted. I look, I mean, I write from a website called Christian Today, and, you know, a lot of good stuff on it, but I'm gutted at the number of evangelicals who come on and who write stuff that is just totally compromising with the culture. And I just think, what are you doing, guys? You know, I, one of my favorite stories, as, as you might imagine, is the, the prophets of Baal and Elisha. You know, when, I mean, that is such a brilliant story. Where's your God? Maybe he's gone to the toilet. You know, where's your God? Where, you know, he's, maybe he's on holiday. And he just, he mocks them in that sense, but he's also showing how pathetic the, their things are. And I just think there's, there's a, an, an enormous danger that we've got into that, we don't want to offend people. And let me say that as well within the church. Because if you're in a small church, and the trouble is, you can't afford to lose any families. And they know that. So one of your leading people will say, you do this, and... And the threat's never explicitly stated. But it's implicit. You will be unhappy and eventually will leave. And you can't afford to lose us. And I don't think you're going to grow a church unless you're prepared to say to such people, I'm sorry. But if this is the way God is leading us, we're going that way. And God bless you if you go and find somewhere else. We don't have any antagonism and hassle, but if you can't handle it, it's not your church. Uh, I, I've seen that. As our church has grown, people have come up and said, this, I just feel this is not our church anymore. To which my response is, duh, it never was. And it's not my church, and it's not your church, it's Christ's church. And... You know, we, we find that as, uh, as we go on. So this phrase about turning the world upside down, I love it, and I, I want us to be known as that. And um, I hadn't realized when I first started preaching, I used this text a lot because when, when I was training in the Free Church College, you get sent around and you don't have time to repair, so you basically have one or two sermons. And my sermon was the world turned upside down. But I hadn't realized that the NIV translation was these people who've caused trouble all over the world have now come here also. So basically, I was going around saying, trouble's here. <laughs> and I little realized how prophetic that would be. Um, but as I say, you've got you to be prepared for that. It's actually quite a dangerous prayer, isn't it? To pray, Lord, use us. Because what if he does? You know, what if God, I mean, sometimes I think we pray and we think, well, what if God did actually send revival and renewal and, and repentance and so on? Wow. I mean, it actually would be very, very uncomfortable. So... Um, that is, is the background to where I'm coming. Um, I want us to... Oops, where's this? Is that... this thing... Oh, I've switched it on. That does help, doesn't it? Where's the switch on button? You find it. Yeah, that's it. That looks like it. Thank you. It does, does help. By the way, if you're going to do tech stuff in a church, make sure you've got a tech person who knows what they're doing. And you are, and I, not usually the minister. Um, Europe, that's a map of Europe that's taken from about four years ago. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a, just a, a vague belief in God thing. Basically, you divide Europe into the Protestant North, Catholic South, Orthodox East, uh, when you, you throw in Islam, communism, secular humanism, New Age. Now, what I find really interesting, by the way, just in terms of Europe overall, is we do an, an international cafe. And um, I know that some of you think Dundee's a backwater, but we do have 100 different nationalities in our city. And uh, 10 
15 years ago, vast majority of the international students who came were Chinese, Iranian, um, you know, um, Malaysian particularly, a lot of Malaysians. About five years ago, for the first time ever, we had more Germans than any other group. Lots of Scandinavians. And I, I began to think, you know, maybe there's something going on here. And I found an openness that didn't exist before amongst many uh, European young people. And I'm, I'm, I'm making no comment on it other than I just found that to be remarkably interesting. But let's talk about England. And I'm talking specifically England. Uh, actually, Scotland, which used to be the kind of known as the land of the people of the book, it's worse than England now. Uh, north of England's pretty desperate uh, in lots of ways. Um, I, I don't know if the statistic is true, but I was told that 50% of white male evangelicals, uh, young white male evangelicals, are in the London area, uh, which, uh, again, I find fascinating. 59.3%, according to the latest government statistics, identify as Christian. That's 33 million. Now, that sounds great, but that is very vague. And look, the key figure is, this was, sorry, 2011. So a decade before, it was 70%. And it's falling dramatically. And that's just general, I'm a Christian, not a Muslim type thing that, that people have. 4.7% identify as Muslim. Now, what's important about that it's not people go, oh, well, when it's 50%, the Muslims kind of take over. No. Basically, when the population of this country comes to about 10% Muslim, you can expect there to be uh, more than a significant, there already is a significant Muslim influence. 25% of the parliamentary seats that were up for grabs uh, last uh, election, the ones that were likely to change, had significant Muslim votes within. And, and here's the difference on the Muslim thing. I went to a mosque in Dundee to speak on a Monday night, not a Friday night, and it wasn't the main mosque, it was one of the smaller mosques, and there was 150 men there for a prayer meeting, 150. I can't think of a single church in my, country, in, in my city that would have 150 men at a prayer meeting on a Monday night, or a Tuesday night, or a Wednesday night, or a Thursday night, or Sunday, Sunday night. And I realized in that mosque there was a, a social cohesion, there was a community, there was an identity, and so on. It doesn't take 50% to change a country. In my view, it takes 5%, 5 to 10%. Uh, give me 5 to 10% of committed evangelical Christians in any community, that community is going to be transformed. So that for me is, 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 is hugely, hugely significant. The other thing you need to realize about Islam and Muslims is our country's devotion to money means that um, universities like Oxford and Cambridge and so on are hugely dependent on money that comes from uh, Islamic states or Islamic I individuals who provide. And w basically where the money is, that's where things are, uh, are going to go. In terms of the Christian community, uh, I, I find it quite helpful in my own Denomination, we used to talk of members, adherents, supporting adherents, and non-supporting adherents. Now, what that meant was members for us were committed Christians. We don't allow people to become members. So a normal, sometimes you get other churches where their membership might be 1,000 and their attendance is 100. For us, membership would be maybe 50, 60. That would mean that the attendance might be 150. Um, you, so members were committed. Your adherents were people who would come along, um, like maybe regularly every Sunday, maybe occasionally. Uh, they might give some money and so on. And then your non-supporting adherents were people who expected you to bury them. And that was, you know, they would just say, and you get people like it. I, I did door to door once, and I remember I knocked on a door, and the guy comes to the door, and I said, are you interested in God? And he says, no, I'm Church of England. So, <laughs> which I thought was superb. Um, <laughs> it was... Um, I remember asking one lady, she said, oh, I'm an elder um, in the Church of Scotland. And I said, oh, does your minister preach the gospel? He had the wonderful name of the Reverend John Pagan. And I said, does Mr. Pagan preach the gospel? And she looked at me in horror and said, oh, no, for goodness sake, no, we're a normal church. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I changed that definition a wee bit. Committed, affiliated, non-affiliated. You think about your own church. Who are the committed people? And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to say that's got to be your membership. If someone's a member in your church and they're not committed, you actually need to exercise church discipline. Now, graciously, gradually, over a period of years. But how do you have people who are members in the church who never attend? I'm not talking about people who are ill, of course, or 
so on. But I'm talking about people who would profess to be Christians who signed up in some way or other, whatever your ecclesiology, and um, then they're part of the body, but they ignore the body. You know, there's, there's, there's something wrong there, and the body has to deal with that. So I think you've got your committed people, and I think it's a shame, by the way, when you get evangelical churches who go, yeah, we've got 200 people who come, and our core group's about 30 or 40. Okay, as, so what about membership? Well, no, we've got about 150 members out of that 200. So, well, how's that your core group then? That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, we need to really change that because one of the problems is in smaller churches, you, you do tend to find that people get very committed because otherwise the church doesn't survive. But then they get a sense of ownership. But as the church grows and becomes bigger, which I think we need more bigger churches, by the way, because of the resources and so on. But then what you find is you find Christian evangelical families especially think, well, this church provides this. This is great to go to. And they can go once on a Sunday and that's it. Now, what kind of Christianity is that? That doesn't make any sense to me at all from a biblical perspective. So um, we we need to encourage uh, commitment. And that's difficult because... Deeply ingrained within many of our people is, oh, they're being legalistic. Like I think, personally, I encourage our folks to come morning and evening. And I've got people who are fine Christian. One of them go, well, that's a bit legalistic, Dave. You know? Sunday's my family time. And I'm going, uh, yeah? Bring your family to church. You know? And, and then I say, I, I like the idea of the Lord's Day. I like the idea of book ending. It worship at the beginning, worship at the end. So it's not too much to ask, really, is it? And they go, oh, well, it's a bit legalistic. And I'm going, yeah, it could be. But I, I, I hear people talk about community and commitment and all the buzzwords. And I, I'm fed up. I just want to see it. You know, I hear people talk about service and serving the Lord. And I'm going off to China and, or I'm going on this mission trip to Africa. I want to know if they come to my house and we'll have a meal with a whole bunch of people, if they're the ones who get up and say, I'll go and do the dishes. Then I'll think about supporting them about going to China to serve the Lord. Um, it's it, for me that the affiliated are people who come along and you really want to encourage them you want to, people who have got some connection with the church and in one sense they can be frustrating because we get people who come in, they come in for one bit and then um, one day you might not see them for six weeks you know they're, they're, they're all over the place uh, one guy came to me and said Dave I'd like to join the church I said oh that's great. I thought, maybe he's been converted because there wasn't any obvious indication previously. Uh, and he just started coming. He says, I said, I'd like to join, he says, but I don't believe in Jesus. And I said, well, that's kind of a big deal here. <laughs> and he looks so disappointed. And I said, why do you want to join? He says, I love it. I love coming. I love, I love the atmosphere. He said, sometimes I even like your teaching. You know? And I said to him, okay, but you can have all of that without joining. I said, we won't. He said, well, I can still come. I said, yeah. He said, I thought you'd want me to join. I said, no, I don't want you to join. We won't let you join. He said, well, why not? I said, because you don't believe in Jesus. And here, belonging to this church means you're saying you belong to Christ. But we want you to come. And why do we want you to come? One, we like you. Two, you're very welcome. Three, you fill out a seat. But four, most of all, the real reason is we want you to hear about Jesus. Because that's what this church is about. And the things that you like about us, it's all because of Jesus. So you're willing, we're happy to have you. And I think you've got lots of people who will be affiliated in some kind of way. We, you might call them adherents, but you've got to think about that. What's your adherent base? What's your uh, affiliated base? How many people are connected with your church who are not Christians? Um, and it's actually worth doing a proper survey of that and looking at that. How many people do you get wander in and out? If you had to make a list of non-Christians who attend or people you weren't very sure or people who profess to be Christians but you, you're not sure where they're at and to pray for them, how many people would be there? And then you think, how do we expand that number? Because traditionally, churches have been very good at evangelizing adherents. What do you think the Billy Graham thing was? It was largely churches taking their non-Christian adherents, contacts, along to hear him. And there was loads of them. But that's why it wouldn't work nowadays. So we've got to think about how we expand that basis. And then there's the non-affiliated. And what I mean by that is, for me, there are people we've got contact with, but who would profess no adherence to us at all, probably would never come along, might occasionally come for a supper evening or 
whatever we do. But the contacts, who have we got contact with? Um, and that, again, is very interesting. That there's a theology of presence, I would call it. Now, when I went to Dundee, I was of the view that buildings were completely irrelevant. And I had to change my mind. Because what we did, we, we were in this old building. It needed to be done up. There was a lot that needed done to it. But the way I put it is this way. If we went to another part of town and did door-to-door work, we'd go through the streets like a dose of salts, like Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, we'd just be... Not interested, not interested, not interested. We do it around our area. People, oh yeah, we know your church. And they point to the building. Now I know the church is not the building. But think about how they think. They look and they see our building. And for an awful lot of people, it's actually a sign of sanity. You go into a housing estate and you say, would you like to come to my house for a cup of tea and a Bible study? Or would you like a latte? (laughs) Or whatever. And, and, And... In in a lot of working class communities, people look at you as though you're some kind of pervert. Who invites people around to their house? For you know, and middle class people go, oh, well, that's not wonderful, that's strange. No, 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 no. That's the kind of Starbucks type Christianity that works for Starbucks type people. You know, but it doesn't work for an awful lot of people. Whereas actually, a church building, well, yeah, it's a church building. That's what I would expect to hear about God and stuff like that. So, uh, there are people who will walk into a church building now. One of the things about a church building in a community is it gives us this idea of presence. And for me, especially in today's age, I would argue that when we, read it, when we read it, did our building, it cost 800,000. But when we redid it, the condition was, I said to the elders, okay, I really want this. We've really got to do it. But we've got two conditions. Number one is this building's got to be open seven days a week. I'm not doing this for having a building open Sundays and a couple of nights during the week. Seven days a week. That changes our whole ministry. Number two is the money we spend on this building. When we're done, we're going to spend double that amount of money on mission and outreach. We don't stop. The building's only a tool. And uh, that's still what we're, we're working on. Now, another possibility is this. You can, I, I think it's great that churches, and this is going to happen more and more, because I think we're going to become under more and more pressure, not be able to get buildings, but we'll meet in schools and other things. But I would still argue you still need some kind of presence. So personally, I would buy a shop on a a front, a a street front, and have an office or a coffee shop, bookshop combined or something that people can go into. Because I want somewhere where people can actually go to. When we redid our church, I said to the architects, I want the theme to be ministry of the word. And they weren't Christians. Well, one of them was, but it wasn't a Christian firm particularly. And I said... Can I explain what that means? And I said, what I want is, I don't mean the guy in the pulpit preaching all the time. But I said, I want any single day people to walk into this building and somewhere in the building there will be people telling people about God in some way or other. You know, so whether it's a youth club, whether it's a cap actually, we've got that, whether it's a sermon, whether it's an outreach event, whether there's lots of different things. So I just want it to be used in that way that people can come. I want people to be able to come in and ask questions. And so, how we make contact with people. Uh, I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, the key thing in England for me is this 25% figure is non-religious. In reality, 44% is what I think the latest one is. Certainly by 2020, it's reckoned to going to be 50%. Um, and that is... Within that group, you will also find an an, an uh, anti-religious group. And I think that does change how we do outreach uh, a lot. Why have we got to this stage? Because it's it's actually been a very dramatic fall. I just want to list these reasons. Um, I won't go into them in any detail. uh, And you may think of others as well. I do think materialism is a massive thing. I, I, I would find it really hard to do evangelism uh, around this area. I mean, we planted a church, bizarrely, the Free Church of Scotland planted a church in Cobham, Surrey, where to buy a council house would have bought you a castle in Scotland. Uh, you know, and, and one of the big problems, straight away, people are so materialistic. And it, it's just, when people are, if you like, well-fed and they've got lots of different things, lots of things, Church and Christianity just becomes an add-on, and for many of them, it's an add-on they don't need. 
So they don't see their need of a savior. Um, I mean, it's a caricature a bit, but I remember doing some evangelism in, in one town in Dumfries in Scotland. And I remember one middle-class housing estate, every door I knocked on, everyone was either an elder in the church or secretary of the Women's Guild or something. And not one was a Christian. It was breathtaking. And then, and they just didn't want to know. They just weren't interested. You know, I mean, I don't care. If you knock on my door and you're a Christian, I'm so happy to actually see you, to know there's a Christian who was doing, you know. But all of them were really resentful. And then I went into a much, much poorer area of town. And we had generally far, far better conversations. And one of the reasons for that was just simply um, they accepted entirely the concept of sin, you know, and that life was a mess and tough. You know, and, and I thought, okay, there is, a, there's a, there is a problem here. And I think the materialism is actually uh, quite difficult. And by the way, I think it's holding churches back. Because I look and I see, um, I used to be involved in politics. And at one point in the Labour Party, there was a Trotskyite movement. And a uh, very, very small group, Derek Hatton, of Liverpool, some of you remember him, he was part of it. But you know what their members did? It's like the socialist workers. They automatically tithed. In fact, some of them did more than tithe. There were some of the more radical ones. Some of the guys I know in Scotland gave half their income. Um, one, Tommy Sheridan, who was a kind of socialist, pro, a proper socialist in that sense, radical communist, Syritzer type, uh, MSP. I mean, he gave half his income back to the party, to stuff. You know, they were very, very, very committed. I find it quite extraordinary that I go to churches... The, the, you can see the crying need. The crying need is for another worker. The crying need is for... And you've got Christians saying, we can't afford that. But they're going off on cruises, or they're going off buying a second car that they don't need. Or they've got to make sure that they get that 50... F- now, is there anything wrong with a cruise? No. Is there anything wrong with having two cars? No. Is there anything wrong with living exactly the same life as the people around you do? Yes, I think there is. Um, no matter how you, f- how you phase it. And I remember uh, a farmer I went to work for, he... He was mega wealthy. I mean, he owned he, or used loads and loads of farms to produce potatoes for chips. At one point, he had the contract for a third of the chips produced in London, which I thought was fascinating. And I worked for him for a wee while. And he lived, he did live in a big farmhouse. He, he did have a, quite a nice car, but he was kind of one of these rich guys who wear scruffy clothes. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like, you don't have to dress posh. If, I mean, really, the really wealthy don't which is why I always look really wealthy. (laughs) But uh, I tell my wife that anyway. Um, And I remember, and he he told me a story. He was converted. He was part of this big family, the wealthy family, and he was converted. And his family tried to have him committed as insane because they were scared about the money, losing the money. And he carried on. He carried on. Uh, Obviously, he wasn't committed. And he gave a huge amount of his money, but nobody ever knew. You you, you never got, here's the guy with the check handing over and photographing the newspaper. So, for example, one of my aunties was a brethren missionary in Africa. He paid for her completely all her life. Not a word. And he used his money to serve the Lord. And that was fantastic, and that was great. Um, And I do often wonder, I look and think, Thomas Chalmers in the Free Church in 1843, when it was founded, he said, no, We're not going to go around all the rich people and get them to pay for the thousand churches and manses and schools that we need. He says, we're going to go around everyone, including the poor, because it gives dignity. And he did a penny a week scheme that the deacons went around, and even off the poor, they took a penny. Now, because of that, they were able to fund not only that, but tremendous work amongst the poor and so on. And I think the level of giving in our evangelical churches overall, when we are substantially really quite well off, is absolutely pathetic. And I think some of us need to think a little bit more... People will criticize Rick Warren. Um, I think he's got some really, really good stuff. Some stuff I disagree with. But I tell you this, uh, a man who pays back his whole salary to the church, who reverse tithes, and who says, why do I need a private jet? He said, I, and he said, look, don't regard me as a, he was asked about this once, and he said, don't regard me as a hero. He said, I can buy what I want, I can eat what I want, I can go where I want. I'm not poor at all. And I think we need to rethink about how we do things. Because we talk about, oh yeah, we love you, Lord, we love you. you know, and, I, and I think <coughs> materialism has really come into us as well. Secularization, that's an interesting one. Um, you have to be careful with the word secular, by the way. 
Because most of us are secular. I don't think anyone here believes the church should run the government. Um, when you know your elders, you think, no, thank you. Let's just stick with what we've got because that's bad enough. Um, so in that sense, we're secular. But one of the key things about our culture is the way that words are used in different ways. So that's why I, I keep saying about asking questions. About what do they mean? Secularization and secular societies is now being used by more militant atheists to just privatize religion, just to put it, you know, get, it, get us out of the main street, get us out of education. Um, and it's, it, it's been incredibly strong. Uh, and it will, it will continue more and more and more. And churches are giving into it far too much. And it will create, in my view, a society which will ultimately result in um, the freedom of Christians to proclaim the gospel being restricted. Now, please don't use the language of persecution at this stage. I think it's unfair and wrong and exaggerated. Um, I think we're at the stage of mockery and prejudice. Persecution is when you're getting beheaded for your faith. Persecution is when you're going to church and you don't know if you're going home. You know, it's, it's not persecution if people mock you at work. It is prejudice, it's ignorance, it's mockery. And that's what we get. I think persecution at the deeper level will certainly come. But secularization is causing enormous um, problems. So it's just default assumed. Schools, keep religion out of schools. Why? Religion's private. Well, I'd say, no, well, keep your secular faith out of schools. That should be private. You know, um, I don't mind if you're a humanist. Just keep it to yourself. Don't let it influence anything. You know, I mean, that's insane to them. Just as... Our Christianity cannot be that. But again, I'm astounded at how many churches have compromised on this whole secularization thing. And church has become something that we go to, not something that we are. David, on yeah. That, on that yeah. persecution, yeah. I've been reading a bit on it recently, and some, even those from China would talk about we're on the same branch, but not necessarily on the same form. Yeah. They would, they would say, just as Jesus says, that all followers of Jesus are Persecuted. Yes. And our definition of it, or the definition in some of those writings, tends to broaden it so that we don't think, oh, just the beheading and the really extreme is persecution, yeah. but the hassle, the pressure. I, I just sometimes think that we, we think we're not persecuted in this country, and therefore we miss the dumbing down, the harassment, the pressure that is subtly being imposed. We don't identify that as persecution, and therefore we don't notice it and respond to it. And okay. We should, so that it's a very subtle sort of thin end of, end of the wedge, but it is a it is a opposition by evil. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and, and maybe let me continue the discussion on that one a, a little bit. I think that all who will live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I think there is a genuine thing as spiritual warfare. And I think when we, but I'm, it's again about how we use words. I, I, I think there's a spiritual battle. Otherwise, Ephesians 6 is meaningless. You know, put on the full armor of God. Um, I've noticed that sometimes we've had a tremendous um, service or a presence of God on a Sunday evening, and then you go home and all hell breaks loose. Uh, isn't it incredible how many families fight before they come to church on a Sunday morning when things are going really well in the church? You know, there's all, so there's that level of war, um, spiritual warfare. There is our own sinfulness, and there is the antipathy that people have towards the gospel when they realize this is the gospel. I mean, they, 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 if they've hated me, they will hate you. So I think, I think in that sense, that's completely right. I think the way that too many Christians use persecution, though, is not making the differentiation between... Um, you know, somebody called me a name because I was a Christian or, you know, we were mocked on Radio 4 or something. Uh, and um, the level that, you know, you talk about the Chinese, but none of us are being faced with our churches being bulldozed at the moment. I think that will come eventually if we carry on the way we're going. So, yes, you're right. But I, would, I, would, I think I would be careful how I use the words because it does sound like we're moaning, oh, Christians are being persecuted. To, and I'm talking, about when I'm, I'm talking about when I debate with, with secularists and so on. 
So I tend to say, well, okay, let's talk about what we mean by that. Yes, we're mocked. Yes, uh, we're laughed. Well, and actually, there is a prejudice and a discrimination, I would say, so that, um, well, I'll give you an example, and, I, and I'm not even going to, when we're recording this, I, I'm certainly not going to give a name, and I won't give the company, but um, I had a woman write a piece, brilliant piece, best piece I've ever seen. She sent it to me. She wrote a piece on why she thought women should not be elders in the church, and it was, it was fantastic, and she's, she's a genius. She's on a fast track in a major company, major finance company in London. And she sent it to me and she said, David, do you publish it? And I said, it's great. Of course I'll publish it. I'll put it out, and, um, I'll put it out uh, you know, under your name. And she said, please don't do that. And I said, what? I said, well, she said, put it out under your own name. I said, well, I didn't write it. She said, I don't care. She said, if you think it's that good, please put it out under your own name. And I did. And I'll put it on my blog, and it's by far the most popular blog I've ever written. <laughs> I didn't write it. So, <laughs> but you know why she had to do that? Because she was scared of losing, not her job, but certainly any promotion prospects and stuff, immediately. Because in this world of the web, things get passed around immediately. And I have so many people like that. I have um, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, uh, social workers, and other people who say, we just can't do this, we can't say this, we can't do that. And I think that's happening more and more in our country, so I think that's right. But I'm, I'm still wary of using the word persecution. In that. So I bet, I mean, yeah, I'm basically agreeing with you and not agreeing with you at the same time. So, <laughs> sorry about that. But yeah, um, the third thing there I've got is false religion. Um, and by that, I don't just mean Islam or whatever. I do think of G.K. Chesterton's uh, famous quote that when people cease to believe in God, it's not that they be, uh, um, believe in nothing, it's that they'll believe in anything. <coughs> and um, paganism is making a return. Uh, in this country, uh, there's all different kinds of things. But for me, the worst kind of false religion is the one that professes to be Christian. And I get in so much trouble for saying this, and I'm not. I don't want to argue for a narrow, legalistic, denominational, you know. Um, I, I visited a church once. I mean, how you'd, there was a minister, he came to see me, and he was in despair because he was hyper, hyper strict Reformed Baptist. Right? And in fact, so strict that he thought I was liberal. But he, he came to apologize to me for having said some things against me. And he'd gone to a church in the south of England where he just asked them to change the name on the notice board. Why? Because it said, Ebenezer Strict and Peculiar Baptist Church. Well, how are you going to evangelize people? How would you like to come to the Strict and Peculiars? You know, you just, yeah, I mean, I, that to me is incomprehensible. But no way were they going to change that. We are a peculiar people. Yep. Over, conversation ended. You know, and they say, oh, well, we're suffering for the faith. No, you're not. You're suffering for being stupid. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that. You know, you've got a great history. Fine, put it in your charitable documents underneath and explain it away. But for reaching people in public. So there is that kind of legalistic thing and th that as well. But I'm talking about where you get people that stand up and say, well, I believe this, but Jesus, you know, and not just even that he didn't just rise from the dead, he wasn't virgin born, a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'd simply say, I'm sorry, but you're not Christian. But you know the thing that gets me is evangelical Christians who say, David, that's not very nice. We disagree with them, but you know, we can't say they're not Christians. Say, yes, you can. Of course you can. Where was Paul really, really strong? The only letter that he doesn't have a greeting of warmth at the beginning, the Galatians. Why? Because of the false teaching about circumcision. What does he say? I wish I'd, they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. And that's the polite translation. You know, and why was he so passionate about that? Because you're turned away from the gospel to a gospel that's not a gospel at all. And my problem is, I, I can't, I'd love to be able to say to people, go to your nearest church and you'll hear about Jesus and you'll see the gospel. And in reality, they could go and it'll put them off for life. Most Christianity in Britain to me is like the flu jag in schools. They give you a small dose of the flu so that you don't get the real thing. Yeah. You would be, as you said, you could ask almost any Christian, you know, are you a Christian? Yes, yes, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Their definition is wrong. Do you think perhaps we might be using the wrong word when we were trying to talk to people about what you said that last night, Jesus must be the very central figure in our evangelism? Do you think there's a connection? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think the word Christian, there's so many, I mean, there's so many different ways that words can be used. I would still use it precisely because someone says, I'm a Christian, I'm going to say, oh, that's really good. So you follow Jesus Christ then? Well, what does Jesus say? Oh, no, I'm not like that. I'm a good person. Oh, sorry, is that, is that what a Christian is? So, you know, I, but I just think, you know, even the, like a word evangelical, what does that mean? In, you know, in today's culture and so on. And then, we, then you go and say, okay, I've got to define myself. So you, you do end up with the modern equivalent of the strict and peculiar Baptist church. I did see a church in Southampton once advertised, and I think it was in Evangelical Times, and the advert astounded me because it said, it, I don't think it was, it couldn't have been a bub bar, because it said, we are, um, I can't remember, I think it was King James, but they did a list of things that they weren't. We don't speak in tongues, we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do that, you're welcome. And I thought, that's just, uh, you're serious. You know, they were identifying themselves by what they're not. And I think we've got to identify ourselves by what we are. And that, I think that's what the early Christians did, knowing that we would be misunderstood. So I, I think the false religion. Now, again, be very careful here because I've got friends in the Church of Scotland, which I think is a compromised denomination, who are doing a marvelous work. And in the Anglican Church and things like that as well, um, sometimes... I would prefer an honest liberal to a dishonest evangelical. In fact, I think I'd always prefer that. Uh, there's a gentleman called um, Scott McKenna, I will name him, because he put on YouTube, Church of Scotland minister, a video saying uh, his, his sermon was, people say that Jesus died for our sins. That's awful, awful, awful theology. And I said about this and people said, oh, that's ridiculous, nobody would say that. I put the clip up and I critiqued it. Well, I have to be fair to Scott because he contacted me and we met what I thought would be a very awkward meeting. Well, as a result, we actually got on very, very well. So I said to him, right, Scott, here's what I'm suggesting. And this is what's going to happen. Pray for it in September. I'm going to his church in September to do a discussion with him, firstly on the atonement, secondly on the nature of the gospel, thirdly on uh, what the church is. People say, what are you doing that for? I say, well, if people in his church are hearing that and accepting it, I doubt that they're a Christian. I get to proclaim the gospel to 300 religious people who are not believers. So I'll, do, I'll go anywhere and do anything along those lines. I think we need to be careful how we deal with false religions and when we call it out um, and what we do. And I think we need to be careful not to divide over secondary issues. I think that's very important. That's why I think the kind of stuff that you do here is really, really important. Um, but false religions done a lot of harm. Insipid, insipid loveless Christianity. Um, I don't know, is there anyone who does more harm to the gospel than someone who actually preaches the gospel or a church that actually proclaims the gospel but doesn't live it? Isn't that a bit like me going around as a salesman with a bottle saying, this is the elixir of, uh, of hair. You put this on your head and you are going to have a full whack of hair. No one's going to buy it from me, are they? So when you stand up and tell them how wonderful Jesus is and they see how rubbish you are and it doesn't make one iota of difference to your life, it just makes you mean and nasty and horrible. When people see more abusive conduct in churches than they do anywhere else, and sometimes that happens in evangelical churches, why would we expect them to believe? You know, they've got, they've got every reason not to believe. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The people of God are a screwed up lot. You know, if, if any of you are in a church where you think, ah, oh, this is just the perfect church, well, you'll last about six months. I, I hate it when someone comes and says, oh, Dave, this is a great church and you're a great preacher and just absolutely love it because within six months, I know I'm going to be the devil. You know, and it's the same preaching and it's the same church, but just the perception changes. And I think, but I think a, a lot of this... Um, you know, I can look out, I can see lots and lots of problems everywhere else. I think I have to look in, first of all, and see lots of difficulties within myself and ask the Lord just to work in my own life and to work in the life of my church. The most attractive thing of the gospel is the church. And you want that. You want people coming in and going, wow. Like I would say, if I was a non-Christian and I came in last night, I would have lots of different impressions and lots of different ideas, but one of them would be, okay, there's something here. There's something going on. And that's what you want. Truly God is amongst you. It's the first Corinthians thing. So, well, I'll leave that. We've got to work. Failure to pass on to the next generation. I think that's a massive one. Um, 
Now, Free Church, my denomination, after the Second World War, had a membership adherent base of about 20,000 people. The Freigemacht, the liberated church in the Netherlands, after the Second World War, had about the same number of people. Fast forward to 2000, the Free Church had about 10,000, more than halved. And the Freigemacht had 180,000. What, what was the difference? Were they good at evangelism? No, they're rubbish at evangelism. But what was the difference was they had their own schools and they took seriously educating their children. And they tended to hold on to their children. When I went to Dundee, more than 50% of the office bearers' children in the free church who'd come in from, out, from other parts to university or to work or whatever didn't go to the free church or, didn't, in fact, didn't go to any church. And you're thinking, we just haven't kept our young people. And part of the reason for that is we, we haven't realized just how dangerous um, the whole environment in which they're swimming is, how polluted and dirty it is. Now, some will argue for Christian schools. I'll go for that. Some will argue for the state schools to have more Christian influence. And, and in England, it's slightly different because you have a third, at least, that are Anglican schools and so on. But I think the primary responsibility here has got to be parents, whatever the schooling system and the homes and all the rest of it. Do we seriously expect to bring up children to live for Jesus if all they do is attend Sunday school on a Sunday morning? and maybe a youth group and a youth club. And the youth group is there to keep them in the church rather than even to, to reach out. Um, I, I get all this, loads and loads of stuff from kids, and I think we need to start taking our children a whole lot more seriously. Uh, I remember my uh, two-year-old daughter at the time. She became the definition of the terrible twos. If I was charismatic, I would have put her down as demon-possessed. But she was, she was wild. I mean, really wild. And... Um, my wife decided when we were in the States on a sabbatical, and when we came back, my wife decided, well, I'm going to give up my job just to be with her for this period. And she did. And uh, my 17-year-old uh, now is an absolute wee angel. Um, well, she was pretty well, you know, fairly. Now, I'm not saying there was a, a completely direct correlation, but I supported my wife in that and agreed with it completely because uh, our children were vi vitally, vitally important. Now, again, please don't misunderstand this. Uh, virtually everyone in my church, and my wife as well. She, my wife went back to work a year later. Uh, women work, and I'm not saying, oh, all women should stay at home, or, and we've got men who stay at home and do things. So I'm, I'm not saying that, but I'm just simply saying that we've, we've lived in this culture where we pass things on all the time. Maybe we need to take responsibility ourselves for our children, and especially in the churches. Every child, no matter your theology of baptism and covenant and so on, every child is part of the church. Not the future of the church. They are the church now. And everyone in the church should be regularly playing, praying for the children and trying to help them. And um, I do think we failed to pass on to the next generation overall. Not entirely, obviously. What can we do? Uh, circle the wagons. It's a very familiar um, church thing. Right, let's defend ourselves. Let's, you know. We can concede. I think this happen <coughs> happens a lot. I just read an article this morning when I got up with a Christian leader in the UK saying, game's over. You know, we've just got to get on and love the culture. No, no, I'm not conceding a thing. I'm not giving one inch of territory to the devil. Game's not over. Christ is still king, and it's still his word, and I'm still going to preach his word wherever I can. And so I don't think we should concede. We can confront, and I'm, I'm using that, you like, I like alliteration, I'm using that in a bad way. Uh, I'm, I'm using that where we, we're using the weapons of this world and not spiritual weapons. Uh, my argument, and I think that's wrong, my argument would be we should always seek change, salt and light. You know, we're seeking to preserve what's good, but we're seeking to bring the light and to genuinely seek change. What changes things is the gospel. Um, I uh, love when I meet a journalist who's been converted or a politician or whatever, I just keep thinking, uh, Richard Dawkins is right in one sense. Biblical Christianity is a virus that infects everything it goes. You can, everywhere you go, you are the perfume of Christ. Everywhere. So I love it. We've started to slot in our evening service, and I learned this, I can't remember who it was from, 
But I picked up, it's one of these ideas I picked up. We've just started it. Just three weeks ago we started it. And we call it um, Plus 18. And I get people up and I ask them, what are you going to be doing in 18 hours' time? And it's wonderful. You've got a nurse and a doctor and a psychologist and a tractor mechanic and a gardener and uh, a housewife and house husband. Uh, you know, you've got um, a pensioner. You've got everyone. And they're just saying, and you realize, wow, we've got this. We've got Christians everywhere. I do like the cliche that we leave the church to worship. Now, in a sense, we come to church to publicly praise God and so on. My view personally is that the primary reason for people coming to church on a Sunday is to have community together, to be taught God's word in community, uh, uh, to bear public witness by praising him and by praying together as well, but then to scatter for, for, for worship in that sense. That it's as though... The church is like a filling station that you get filled up, or it's like a hospital that you get healed, or it's like, you know, and that's why I, I don't understand Christians who say, well, I'll, I might go to church and I might not. I don't think I might go to the petrol station when I need fuel, or I might not. I will. I need fuel. I need fuel all the time. I, I, I belong to the reformed world, and I've got a friend who says, you're not truly reformed unless you have a service every single day, because <laughs> that's what Calvin and the other guys did, you know, and actually... Um, you know, I, I get fed up with all the kind of minutiae of arguments that people have about things. I just say, well, where's the love for the word? Where's the love for the Lord? You know, I loved it when a woman was converted and she came to our Thursday prayer meeting the following uh, Thursday. And I said to her, what are you doing here? And she looked at me as though I was completely insane. And she said, how do you expect me to go a whole week without hearing the word of God? I said, you're going to stand up in the prayer meeting and tell people that. Because lots of Christians go, I think I'll take a break. This. I'm going, I can't, how can you go without hearing the word of God? I mean, that to me illustrates something that's wrong. I, I, you can tell I like my food. If I don't eat my food, my wife knows there's something wrong with me. And I think surely that's the same. So we're looking for change. Um, why persuasive evangelism? Our evangelism is stage one, not stage five. Now, this is important. Um, as I said, well, I mentioned this before. Stage 10 is you know the Bible inside out. Stage zero is you don't know what a Bible is. Most of our evangelism and evangelism programs are still based at uh, stage four or five. I love Christianity Explored and we used it, but it demands too much commitment for most of the people I know who have a vague interest. So we need to get something else that will take people on from that. In my culture, asking people to commit to seven nights in a row to study the Bible, you know, one per week or whatever, it, it's often too much. You know, when people get to that stage, I think it's wonderful. Um, I still use it, and I'll continue to use Christianity Explored, but there's got to be a whole lot more than that. We've got to think, how do we get the stage zero, stage one people? And I think that's most people. Defeater beliefs, you've got to get rid of the defeater beliefs. This is what Tim Keller calls them. The beliefs that stop people even considering Christianity. And you've got to be incredibly patient with that. So, classic, I don't believe in God because of science. It's a classic defeater belief. I don't believe in God because there's suffering in the world. Um, I do. I'm going to come back to the, the, the ten of those stuff and things. I do think it's really good to have uh, books on that. What you're trying to do all the time is deconstruct the way that people think. Their minds are a tangle, and sometimes you can go in and blow them apart, but mostly you can't. You've just got to graciously and gently unpick. And my aim always is to get people to doubt. I really do want to mess with their heads. You know, because I'm saying, well, wait a minute, are you so sure about that? Are you? Really? This is what you think. And then talk about it. And I, that's how I would use films and so on. Not to try and sort of be trendy and cool and stuff, but I would, I would um, you know, a film like The Matrix. I would just say to someone, wow, what do you think? I, one of my best friends was an atheist from New Zealand, and we went to see a film called Apocalypse Now many years ago, which if you've seen it, is just... Uh, it's from Conrad Black's Heart of Darkness, and it's just so manically depressing. I love manically depressing films. I, I love Leonard Cohen, and I'm the kind of guy who, if you put me in a room with a bottle of malt whiskey and a knife and Leonard Cohen and some really dark, depressing films that have an ounce of happiness in them, I'm happy, or I'm not going to make it through the night. Um, but anyway, I went to see Apocalypse Now, and... Uh, at the end, if you've seen that film, 
it's basically about, it is about mankind's heart of darkness, that this guy who's going to, been sent to assassinate this American commander who's gone mad in Vietnam, um, he comes to realize, actually, he's not mad. This is humanity. And it just finishes like that, and it finishes with him calling in the bombers to just wipe out his whole cult that he's got around him. And it's just spectacular, boom, 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 you know, and... Uh, it's the only film I've been to where at the end people stood, stand up to get out when the credits are going and then they stopped and just stood in shock as this happened. And as we went out, my friend turned to me and he said, shut up, shut up, not a word. I said, what? What? He said, I know, I know. He said, humanity's rubbish. I know it, just don't start. And I said, okay, you've got the message. Now we'll come on to part two. And later he said, ah. So, but stuff like that helps you deconstruct, and so on. Defeat your beliefs. Our faith is reasonable. Um, please, please, please never say to people, well, look, I just believe because I believe. That's wrong. I think we've got to say to people, look, it's reasonable to believe in God. It's reasonable to believe in Jesus, is where I would go, actually. And it doesn't make sense not to. We've got the best product in the postmodern marketplace of ideas, and I, it's what I would call total apologetics, the whole gospel to the whole person by the whole church. It takes, you know what they say? It takes a church to raise a child. It takes a church to evangelize. And I, I'm absolutely deadly, deadly serious about this. I would not go to a church that I could not invite anybody to. I wouldn't, I couldn't. I want to be able to take my non-Christian friends and family, if they would come to the church, and I want them to come into that church. I'm not talking about being seeker friendly. I'm talking, because duh, that's what they should be anyway. But I'm talking about, I want to know that if I take my non-Christian brother or my non-Christian friend into this church, they are going to hear and see something of Jesus. And they're not going to walk out and go, oh, I'm, that's all, I don't want anything to do with that, it's rubbish. They can walk out because they're angry and they can walk out because they've, you know, they're, they're resentful against it and everything else. But if, they, if they're not, Going to hear about Jesus. And I tell you that this is the, if, think, do the maths. If the number one reason that people come to church is because they're invited by friends, why are there so few new people coming to your church? Because people in your congregation don't have enough confidence to invite them. Maybe they're afraid within themselves. Maybe they're happy. Maybe, maybe they'll go as lots of people do. I like this church. It's good for me. But I don't think my friends and family would go for it at all. Well, that's a challenge we, we, have, we have got to deal with. Your best evangelists are always people who are newly converted. Why? Because they say, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did, straight away. You have got to get that enthusiasm in people. You have got to get people talking on the streets and at homes. You know you're getting somewhere as a church when people go home from the church to have Sunday dinner or whatever. And by the way, hospitality is massive in evangelism. And they're sitting around the table talking about what they've just heard in church. You know that you're making it then. And I, I think that we've, we, we've got to try uh, and do it with that. And one of the other things in, in that is just simply the whole gospel to the whole person by the whole church. Somebody says to you, well, what about this? You say, I don't know, but there's somebody in my church who will. Or I can ask, you know. And So I, I'm, I'm back to this that I've said, I think, every single thing. In the DNA of the church, there has to be this desire to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ. Or I'm not sure that it's a church that's worth surviving. I went to a congregation that had seven people. It had no choice but to grow. It's not going to grow by Christians coming because Christians don't go to churches that are tiny and collapsing and dead as can be. Or, or even if they're not dead, they don't want to go. They want, it's too much work. It's too much hassle. So it had to be conversion. But I want to say this too, if your church is 200, 300, it's the same deal. You're a generation away from collapsing. You know, so you need new people um, coming in. Sorry, I didn't move that on. That's what I was, uh, yeah. that's what I've, I've been, um, yeah. Oops. Right, we'll take, I want to stop there because we'll take a break for coffee. We'll come back to, um, if that's the background and so on, we'll come back to one of the things that I've been trying, we're trying to do some, maybe just lots and lots of different suggestions. Some of them you'll pick up on, some of them, some of them we've had great ideas, we haven't done them yet. Um, 
and you might have other great ideas and so on. But I do think the reason we're going to do that is because I think um, it's the shotgun approach to things. I, I just think, try anything, see what happens. Because one of the great things is this. In the Christian church, you're allowed to fail. You know, in the world, you're not allowed to fail, but we're allowed to fail. And I do lots of things that fail, but sometimes they work, and God blesses them, and you see what happens.